Hey everyone, thanks for coming back to the channel. In today's video, we're going to be going over Notion Formula 2.0. We've created two databases in and out, and we related them to each other. And we're going to use this example today to create various formulas using the map, filter, ifs, contains, various dot notations to interact all of these properties that we see here in the in table, and we're going to output it here in the out table. And so we're going to create about eight or so formulas that sort of build on each other like I have been in my previous video. And in today's example, we're going to be using in and out as just a basic sort of inputs to outputs example. For example, if you're selling a product or there's a project you're working on or some inventory you're tracking, many inputs might make a single output. We're going to be learning how to filter based on certain criteria. Filter when certain properties on certain criteria are important and how we can sort of combine constraints and different properties to sort, organize, and group things based on what we know. I think the biggest change with Notion Formula 2.0 is how rollups are not going to be as helpful. Obviously, they have their own merits, but in today's example, we are not going to use any rollups, and we're only going to rely on this relation property that we've created here. And that's all we're going to be relying on is a relation property and we're going to be sort of creating some arbitrary dates, people, number, text, and select tags to sort of illustrate how you can take your Notion Formula 2.0 to the next level. I think we're going to start with the map function and we're going to sort of slowly scale up to doing more and interacting more properties with each other as we get further along in this video. I think this one might be a slightly longer one um, because I want to be very clear, concise, and accessible. Again, Notion Formula 2.0 is made by developers for developers, and so I'm not really a developer myself, and I still have a lot to learn, but this is sort of what I've started to practice with and started to build on so that we can always get a little deeper, sort of start to add layers to our formulas. Let's start by creating some arbitrary dates. In a conventional rollup, we could just take that, take the date, show original, right? That's helpful, but I think with formulas, you can do this and more, right? So today we're going to exclusively work just in the formulas because it can do more than just rollups. Instead of using the rollup to gather all those dates in one place, we're going to use the map function. Map, parentheses, notice how it sort of gives you an example of how you want to use the map function. In our case, we want to start with the relation. So in our case, it's in. So it pops up here, so we can just click on this. We want to add a comma to separate it, like we do in the example. And we want the date. And so something new to formulas 2.0 is the current. And that just references, hey, this is the current data that we're going to be accessing. And this is what we want from it. And so you're going to be seeing this current word a lot. I strongly recommend that you get familiar with using current and the dot notation as well. I think the dot notation is a huge change. And although it might seem more complicated in the beginning, I hope by the end of this video that you can see how valuable it can be and how useful it is to combine several things at once, right? So in our case, we want to use the dot notation. So we're going to add a period right after the current and see what happens here. When we do that, it basically says, let's let's pick a property from this relation that we just related to. So of all the properties in in, which one do we want to select, right? In our case, because we want to extract the date, we want to click on date, and then it conveniently says you got to close the formula with the parentheses. So we will click on done. Now we have our dates. And that's just through this very simple formula map. We're going to be building on this map formula. But I think this is really one of the easiest ways to start using a formula is, hey, let's just pick our relation, specify the current, and then select the property in which we want to see or relate from. So notice how easy that was. It took less than a few seconds to write that up, right? We just have our relation, current, dot notation, and then our property. What's cool with this new dot notation is at the end of this, we wanted to say, hey, let's sort by... Let's sort the dates. Let's sort from earliest to latest, right? Naturally, because some people might want to see this in order. And so 
What's really cool about this new Formula 2.0 dot notation is we can do another dot sort. And notice how this two parentheses comes up and it has to be called. And basically what we're doing is adding another dot and then saying, hey, we want to just sort it by calling this function in. And what's nice about the dot notation is we don't have to open and close the whole formula like we used to in the past. We just need to create that dot, sort, and open and close it and notice how it is now sorted. I just wanted to show you this because this is sort of how dot notations can take it to the next level, right? Like we can also do first, which takes the first entry in the list, as we see here, and last, which takes the last entry from the list, see here, right? And notice how you can just start stacking these dot notations and how based on this formula we've created, it'll always take the last sort sorted date because last returns the last item in the list. So if we delete that, we just go back to our sort order, which was the three original. We wanna reverse the sorting order, right? And so here's another helpful sort order, right? Now we're going from most recent to the oldest. I'm just providing you this other example because again, this dot notation is, you can really build it up and add these layers, right? And then you can use it first, right? Obviously this is a little overkill, Right? You don't need to reverse and then ask for first or last, but I just want to again illustrate the power of these dot notations that start to familiarize yourself with. Right, This is pretty powerful stuff and I don't want to sort of neglect these new features at all because it's totally different. Right, it's The video I made on Formulas 1.0 is so different than it is now that all, all of what you know from Formulas 1.0 is almost obsolete. That's my opinion, you know, you're entitled to your own. but I do really want to emphasize how if you really want to learn Notion Formulas 2.0, you got to learn dot notation. You got to learn some of these new functions that I'm going to be going over today. Again, I'm still learning, right? So nothing's perfect. I'm going to try my best here. I think our next example here is it's great that we can show all these dates, nothing new here. But what if we want to sort of filter these dates? And what if we want to filter based on if it's in the future or not, right? So we're just gonna change that real quick to September 30th. And let's create a new formula to filter based on if the date is in the future, show us that entry. So we're gonna take it up another notch, right? Not, let's not just extract everything and show what it is. Now let's take what we see or take what we're relating to and show us the entry in which the date is in the future. It seems very simple. It actually is pretty simple. But again, with this new notation, I'm going to take my time with it so that you all can understand how to get started, right? So I'm going to know which of these entries, examples one, two, three, are in the future. We know that it's example two, so we want to output example two. So how are we going to do that? Similar to what we did in maps, we're going to take this similar notation, specifically the current date in part, and we're going to filter. And in this case, we're going to actually use the filter function. And before we do that, we need to call the relation. So what's nice now is with Notion formulas, nothing gets deleted. And so even if the formula doesn't work, all the text will stay. In formulas 1.0, you lose everything, right? And you have a lot more of this helpful text um, and all that. So in our case, we want to start with the relation in. And notice how a relation is always going to have that gray hover box. Something I've noticed recently is when you're trying to copy formulas over into a new property, for example, you need to actually call back these relations manually because Notion just receives that copied text as just standard text and not, not like this rich relation text that we're going to be calling here. So now that we've called our relation, we're going to use that dot notation again, but this time with the filter function. So we're going to add that dot. And notice how when you add the dot, it comes up with all of these other formula functions, right? And again, we're just touching the surface here. And we're going to be exploring some of these. And I urge you to just kind of play around with the dot notation and learn what all of these do. There's also a nice Notion Formula 2.0 syntax website that I'll link in the description below um, that I think is immensely helpful as well. In our case, we're going to be using filter. And what that does is for this relation in, we're going to filter on this criteria. And again, we're going to use that current, right? It, it's nice that it already pops up current, right? So just click on that. 
the current will never have that background because it's just kind of a standard variable that's built into each format. And again, we're gonna use that dot notation and we're referring to dates, right? When we click on dot, it'll show you all the properties that are connected in the relation. And in our case, it's date. So now we have a filter based on current date. But in our case, we wanna filter it based on whether the date is in the future. So how are we gonna do that? One really valuable function that Notion has is the now. And what that basically does is it basically spits out current time and date of when you enter that text. And so in our case, if the future date is in the future, it's going to be after now, right? The future date is September 30th. Now it's 919. So it's going to be later than it is now, right? And so what we're going to do is going to use this inequality sign to say this current date is happening later than now, right? Because the future always happens after now, right? And then the past happens before now. If you switch up these inequality signs, we'll look for dates you know, in the past, we want to look for dates in the future, we want to do greater than now. Notice how this expected token comes up with the parentheses, so we'll close it, click done. It's really nice that the output shows, and, and notice how it doesn't show in the formula field yet because you need to click done for it to show, right? And would you look at that? Example two, September 30th, that's future date, right? Now if we switch this around, we're going to get the reverse, right, because these are in the past, first and twelfth. It's in the past of today, which is the 19th. So there we go. That's the filter function, right? And notice how if we compare the map, compare the filter, they have very similar structures, right? You have that relation, you have that dot notation, and then you have that current relationship and sort of the criteria in which you want to filter by, right? In this case, we're just sorting at the end. In this case, we could sort, but there's only one, so it's not going to be that helpful. It's nice that example two is showing by name, right? Oh. It looks like example two has a future date. Well, what is that, right? We can't really tell. I mean, maybe if we look at example three and we say, oh, it looks like it's in the same row September 30th. Maybe example three is September 30th. Well, in this case, it's saying example two is September 30th, right? But it doesn't say what date example two has, which is in the future, right? And so basically what I'm saying is this is filtering based on the name when perhaps maybe it's helpful to filter based on the date. What we're gonna do next is we're gonna combine the map and filter functions into another formula to show date. And instead of showing the future date by the name of the entry, we wanna show it by the actual date. So basically we're trying to do what we're outputting in example two, but we wanna just show it by its date as opposed to just its name. And so how we're gonna do that is again the combination of map and filter and we're just going to switch up the order a little bit so we're going to start with the map we got to start with our relation which is in we're going to do the filter that we initiated in this previous example right so we're going to use the current dot notation dates right make sure you click on the pop-up because if you just click on text it'll just show like that like the raw text and that doesn't really work that well. And then the filter was, it's later than now. And again, because now is just referring to itself, we need to close this parentheses for the filter. But notice how in map, right, it's in red text, so it means the formula isn't working to its full potential and it needs work. We're gonna go a little deeper and say, instead of just filtering by the date, we also wanna output the date of that filter, right? Not just the name like we did here. So in order to do that, we just kind of repeat this current date, right? We want to show by date, so we just do current date, click on it, and then notice how close parentheses appears, bam, we see that output, nothing there, click on done, now it appears. So now what we've basically done here is, look, when we filter it out, we want to show the current date, right? Not just the default entry name, right? And notice how if you compare the, the show dates and the future dates formula, the show by date is basically a, a combination of the two. And map and filter are both being used, and we're just specifying how we want to output this criteria. Right? We're just adding in that tiny bit, that last section, that last comma section where it says, instead of showing by name, let's show by current date. Right? And we see that here because September 30th is later than now, 
we're going to show that by date. So hopefully, you know, this sort of making sense. Obviously, if you're not familiar with Notion Formulas 2.0, this might be a lot. But I do think that these three functions alone can help you do a lot. And I think these are very foundational to doing more with Formulas 2.0. Hope in this video I can, although it's going to be a longer one, we can build on every one of these properties and create a formula that interacts with all of these. For the next formula that we're going to do, let's add my name to that future entry in which the date is in the future, right? Notice how we show that by date here, which is really handy. But now what if we want to show any other property? How can we go about showing a different property for that filter? This is where dot notation is very handy. It's instantaneous and it's really easy. Something I like to do, quote unquote pro tip, is when you're playing around with formulas and you want to experiment with them, but you want to keep what you had in the beginning, I just right click on it, duplicate it, and then kind of rename it, right? The reason why I added myself to the person property is let's show the future date by the person that it's assigned to. And what I just did is duplicate this formula so they're identical. And you might think, oh man, show my person. That seems like a really hard thing to do, but let me show you how easy it actually is. So we just have the same exact array and notice how the very end it says current dot date. So this is where it says show the dates, right? In which you're filtering by. In our case, because we want to show by person, we've got to just delete the date, leave the dot notation and notice how it just hovers over the properties, right? We don't even need to type anything. We can just click on person. Notice how it output shows, click on done, and would you look at that? Identical formulas, all we had to do was change the dot notation of the current property and then show the person. So we can go ahead and do that with any other property, right? And all you have to do is delete it and then select the property that you'd like to see, right? Not started, the status. Even do the checkbox, right? It's empty, right? We can't click on it, but it'll just output via the checkbox. The more you know, right? And I hope these four examples alone can show you that the powerful dot notation that I urge you to become familiar with, right? We use the map and the filter functions. We know sort of how to start to filter things, right? So we're going to create another formula and we're going to use the ifs function, brand new feature of Notion 2.0. And I do think it's worth sharing with you all in this video because it basically makes nested ifs so much easier. You know, if you checked out my other video, um, I went over that a little bit, but this new ifs function is just so much easier to use. Let's say, for example, we want to interact the number and checkbox properties with this one. If the checkbox is not empty, let's show it out here. Maybe with checkbox means that apply special attention to what you're working on, whatever it might be. And so we want to say the checkbox is checked. Let's show it here. And the reason why I'm doing this example is because a checkbox is either marked as empty or true. Um, and that requires a different level of formatting for the filter. And let's begin with the simple filter that we started with in previous examples. So we're going to start with in, that relation, right? It's called in. Maybe should have made it a little longer, but it's okay. We want to filter, and we want to do it by current dot checkbox, right? Whenever someone checkboxes, it's basically saying, show it. I, I actually didn't know this is the case, but something that you could specify also is when it's not empty, we want to call it. The explanation point is another one of those new Notion features, which signifies not if you put it in front of a other function like empty. So in this case, when it's saying not empty, we want to filter it. In this case, the formula itself didn't change a whole lot. But in our case, I think it's a better way to specify those constraints, even when you might not need them. Again, I'm just introducing this because the not function is going to be almost as equally valuable as if it is true, right? Because in some cases you just don't need certain things and you need to specify that. Let's say if the checkbox is not empty, let's spit something out, right? And so this is where we're gonna use the ifs function. We start with the ifs, open parentheses, and once we have our criteria, we need to specify what to output. We have a simple checkbox. This is gonna be the output in relation to the criteria that we specify. In this case, we're just spitting out text. So we're gonna use quotation marks and then write it out. Once we close it out, notice how it's empty. It's empty because there's no checkboxes, right? So I click on the checkbox. Now it says checkboxed, right? In our case, because 
it's just saying if any of them are checkboxed, we're just going to spit out that text. So if you do more than one checkbox, it doesn't really affect the output. So that's helpful. And this is another ifs function. So it's saying if it's not empty, do this. I also want to sort of interact how we want to use numbers. Let's say if someone entered a number that was over a specific number, we also want to spit out a certain criteria, right? So let's say when it's checkboxed, we can show it's checkboxed. And with ifs, really easy to create criteria and then set what the output should be. So in this case, let's say if, again, we're going to use that filter function again, right? So we're going to use in to start the relation, dot filter, and we want to use the current, right? Current to call the property in which we're referring, the dot notation period, we can call that number. So now we want to specify the criteria of the number that we want to sort of create an output for. So let's say if it's greater than 100, we want to create a separate output. Now that we have this criteria specified, we have to create a output. Let's add that comma to separate the output over 100. That's just some text, quotation marks to specify that it's text. Notice how it says expected token, parentheses. We'll go ahead and do that. And done. So because there are no numbers that are inputted that are over 100, nothing will pop up. But let's say 99, right? Nothing's going to pop up. It's 100. Nothing's going to pop up because we didn't specify if it's equal to or greater than. So it has to be greater than 100. So if we do 101 here, we get that over 100. And then if we do the checkbox, for example, it overrides that. It's a very important distinction to understand so that the top layer ifs are going to take precedent over the, the bottom layer ifs. So if you start, because we have the checkbox higher than the number, if we checkbox any property that has that number that's higher than 100, it'll override that filter. Same here, right? Even if it's over 100 on one of these properties, the checkbox overrides it and says, oh, well, if any of these other ones are checkboxed, let's, let's actually spit that out first before we say the over 100 output. And the reason why I show this is because when you're sort of mixing criteria together, it's important to know the distinction because some of these outputs might not work the way you wanted to. Let's say if you had a number that was over 100 and a checkbox, you, won't, you wouldn't actually know that a number was over 100 right, because the checkbox is overriding it. That's something to just keep in your notes, right? It's it's not perfect. It's You sort of have to prioritize the hierarchy of the ifs and so on and so forth. Let's say, right, if two criteria were met, let's say a number was over 100 and checkboxed, right? Let's not just show checkbox. Let's show a different output. In this case, we're creating a double criteria formula function. And what that means is we're going to have to use the and formula that we've discussed in Notion 1.0. And I still think it's still holds valuable in Notion Formulas 2.0. Again, with ifs, you can just start creating criteria and then start generating outputs. In our case, we want to create an output where if the checkbox is checked and the number is over 100, we want to create a certain output. In our case, because we know we have these criteria already specified, what we can actually do is copy, paste, control, copy, paste. I'm going to add the and function, right? Because we're just reusing those filters we created. So I'm going to grab both and then copy them and see what we did here, right? So we're taking both of these filters and saying, if both of these are the case, we want to create an output. And again, back to what I was saying, when you copy and paste formula text, notice how the checkbox and the number properties don't have that gray background. And so that's where we have to go back, specify it, and get back that gray, gray uh, background again. I'm going to do that here with the number, right? And Notion formula is smart enough to output, oh, you're talking about the number property. So we just click on it. When both of those are the case, we want to create a different output, right? So we're going to do a comma, and we want to call it checked and over 100, because those are the matching criteria that we combine, comma. And so now, basically, it's saying when both of these are true, let's spit out that. If only one of these is true, spit out checkbox. If one of these is true, if it's just over 100, it'll specify over 100. But if we do both, it'll say checked and over 100. And I actually want to show you the sort of hierarchy and ordering of this um, formula, right? If we are to actually put that at the end, right? So we're basically just switching the order. Again, remember when I copy and paste, you got to re-specify those.
properties. This is one of those things where just copy and paste will automatically break a formula simply because you didn't specify or recall these actual variables or properties. Notice how now if I do checkbox of 100, it doesn't show, right? It just says checkboxed. Even though this is over 100, it just says checkboxed. And the reason for that is because this specified criteria is at the end of both of these other ifs. And because it's at the end, these other filters, the checkboxed and over 100, are overriding this third criteria. And so I think it has a lot to do with exclusivity and how if you have overlapping criteria, it's going to take the one that you specify first as opposed to what you specify last. Again, if you switch this ordering at the top here, you've got to specify those variables. Now, because we specified at the beginning, we use the AND function. When we do checkbox it and it's over 100, it'll specify, right? Do what you will with that. But I just wanted to illustrate how ifs have that sort of hierarchy where if you want to recall a certain set of conditions and you want to use AND or OR, I would layer that at the top so that these other sort of smaller filtered outputs don't override this and output that we created here. Hopefully that wasn't too confusing, but that's, I think, helpful to know because it's interesting to think that the order of how you specify a formula can greatly change the output that you're hoping for. The last three formulas that we're going to be going over are going to be interacting the text, status, and select properties that we see in our in relation. I think we're going to use another if function, and this time we're just going to use a simple if function. And we're going to use the, the contains function. So if a certain text appears in this text property, let's make it do something. And so again, we're going to go back to the basics, right? If, and then we want to create a filter, right? So if this is the case, then do this. And so in this case, we're just using a filter to set that criteria. Again, we got to start with the database relation dot filter current, right? And then because we're calling the text property, we want to just use the dot notation to include this like text. And now because we're going to be, we want to extract text that matches specified text in this property, we're going to use the contains function, right? And again, if you use the dot after this property, these are all the other sort of formula functions that you can use within this formula instance. And I've said it already, and I'm going to say it again. There's so much room for experimentation, and I greatly encourage you to sort of play around with these, right? I think there's a lot of opportunity. If you're already in over your head, obviously don't you don't need to do this, but I challenge you to go a little further, right? Because you can always go a little further with Notion Formulas 2.0, and there's tremendous opportunity for those people that really know what they're doing and that can show it via formulas. In this case, we're going to use the contains. Notice when you click on it, it already has a closed parentheses. In this case, let's say if the text contains our favorite word, notion, we want it to spit out a certain thing. In this case, because we haven't closed the filter parentheses, we got to add another one. And then we have to add some outputs, right? And if function says, if this is true, then do this. If it's not true, do this. So if it is True, let's say we love Notion. Okay. Let's just make a silly one there. Otherwise, let's just leave it blank. So what we can do is just do double quotation marks, which just says, let's not do anything, like leave empty. We close that up like it suggests there. Now that this is empty and says no results, we can do done. Now that we've set this formula up, if we do text, right, if we just do any sort of text, and we add the word Notion, boom. We love Notion, lowercase Notion, right? That's see what happens. Notice how it's case sensitive, right? It has to be capitalized because that's what we specified here, right? So that is kind of where, right? So if it's just lowercase, doesn't do anything. If it's capitalized it's and identical to the contains text we specify, we can choose that output. We love Notion. Again, right? I just wanted to create an example for each of these properties because everyone has a different use case for formulas 2.0 and I feel like a bunch of these formulas you can interact or layer within each other do a lot of different things so I think next on our list is using this status property let's say because we have three examples in this one output maybe we can see how many of these inputs 
we haven't started on, right? So what if in progress and maybe one's done, right? Let's count how many of these related entries are in the not started phase. We're going to use the filter function, right? I hope by now, because I've been repeating myself over and over and over again, um, it becomes second nature. Start the basics, right? You start with the relation, dot filter, open parentheses, current, and then dot to specify that property, right? So in our case, it's status, current dot status. And we were thinking of, let's count how many we haven't started, right? Because the goal is to get everything be started. And so it'd be helpful to know how many, if there are many entries put into the output, how many haven't been started. So in this case, all we have to do is say, when the current status is equal to, right? Equal is double equals in formula notation. It's not just one. And that's a very important distinction because that could break your formula, which isn't fun. We want to do exact specified text. In our case, because our status is called not started, lowercase s, right? Very important there. We're filtering based on the status is not started, right? In this case, it's saying, oh, example two is not started. Oh, that's really helpful, right? But what if we just want the number of entries that haven't been started as opposed to the names. So instead of just a text formula output, we want a number, a numerical output for how many have not been started. So in our case, we can use another dot notation method. We're going to add that dot, right? And with the dot notation, you can put this at the end or whatever. In this case, because we want the quantity of entries in which the status is not started, we are going to use the length, number of total entries that are related to this one entry in which the not started is true. So we're going to click on length. Notice how it immediately outputs one. Click on done. And notice that, right? Basically, it's saying it looks like there's only one of the layered example tasks, right, in which there's one not started. And then when we change this to not started, it goes to two. This is a really great way to count the number of entries in which you've met a certain filter. And again, this is slightly different than what we've been working on here. I do feel like eventually you're going to want to start to count the number of entries as opposed to just outputting a specific property like we did here or here using nested ifs or the contains function and kind of getting deeper into the counting of sorts, right? Instead of just a singular property output. I think the last one we're going to do here is one with the select field. And again, the select field's another property that you might use to interact with your Notion Formulas 2.0. In our case, let's say because this information is basically what we need to know, we're only going to use the select field for specifying outliers or we're only going to use it when something happens. And so maybe in this formula we say, if it's not empty, then do this, right? So in this case, we just want to know if something's been filled in the select field. And if it has, let's let's show the name of that. And maybe we can add some text. So in our case, we're going to use the map function, sort of going back to where we first started in relation. Again, the filter I shouldn't have to uh, tell you by now. But in our case, because we don't want when we want to know when it's not empty, we're going to use that explanation empty combo. So explanation empty open parentheses. And again, because we've got to refer to the current property, we've got to do current dot notation, select that select field. Okay. We've got to make sure we close it because we're saying when this is empty. And then we also got to close it because of this filter category. Right? Now that we have some filtering, we need to show how we want to map it by. Right? Like now we've selected all of the entries in which the select field is not empty. And now we got to choose how we want to output it. So add that comma and let's output the name and we got to refer to current dot notation and let's re let's use the name, right? Let's let's give the name out. It'll output the name when the select field is not empty. Okay, so let's just close that real quick. Like it mentioned, we can click on done. Because none of these select fields are filled, we're not seeing anything there, but let's just say Yep. Oh, it looks like example one had a select field that was filled. Yes. 
now it looks like example one and example two both have select fields that are not empty, right? And it just aggregates total and responsively reflects that. So let's say we wanted to create an output that says, well, these these properties had a had some nodes that we have to look at, right? So what we can do here is if we wanted to add some text, for example, right? These were marked with notes. Let's say if the select property was a way for people to mark notes, let's sort of create that notification saying, hey, these were marked with notes, maybe you should check them out, right? So in this case, I'm just adding that text. In the past, I used the concat formula to aggregate everything, but now with Notion Formulas 2.0, you can just use quotation marks, write text in, and then add, the, use the plus, use the plus sign to combine text, right? And then you can see that output, and now, when you add that text, it shows for each of those list items, right? Maybe that's a little excessive, maybe not. But again, this is just to show you that you can seamlessly combine text with property. Notice how there's no space there. All we have to do is add a space there. Space. Now there's a space between notes and examples. Right? Maybe that output isn't what you desire. But again, this is just to show you that you can add some supporting text and then combine it with the name. Maybe if it's not the name, we can do date. Now it's, these were marked with notes. Oh, looks like September 12th and September 30th. We got to make sure we revisit those because there are notes based on the select field, right? Boom. Oh, only one now with notes. We delete it, gone. So in this Notion Formula 2.0 tutorial, we went over how we can use one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different Notion database properties and how we can interact them with the map, filter, ifs, contains, empty, and obviously the dot notation to create these varying outputs. I first showed you how to filter and then sort of create an output based on the filter in which you specify the property. Um, you can sort of interact with ifs. We can use the contains function to sort of see if certain text exists. We can count things. We can combine, you know, added text with some of these formulas as well. Or not some, but all. Hopefully this video was informative, it's helpful. I mean, I basically repeated the same thing over and over again, but I do feel like the map filter functions and also the dot notation stuff is foundational to all Notion Formulas 2.0. And I hope that you were able to sort of understand how these interact and how you can interact these with even stuff like the length, stuff like the sort, so much more that you can explore, right, with the dot notation. Obviously, it's not going to work for all properties, but this is, again, just a basic, basic surface level tutorial on how to use Notion Formulas 2.0. Hopefully, you got something out of this video, and if you did, leave me a comment or a like or what you learned, and thanks for sticking around. I think this was a pretty long one. Hopefully, I didn't bore you to death. So, keep on notioning and optimize your Notion workflow. Yeah, have a good one.